Okay, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. How are we? Doing well. Good, good. <laughs> See, I'm getting better already at saying good afternoon for you, for the European uh, audience there, Mark. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the uh, minority today. I see. That's right. That's right. We yeah, we, we have we actually have the side of the pond. Yeah, that's right. That's why uh, actually your feed's not bad today, um, considering you're mm -hmm. the furthest away. Normally, that's maybe part of the reason why you're very grainy. But we have a special guest. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer Turnage from Queen's University. Um, welcome. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, and it's great to have you, uh, Jennifer. We've um, obviously I've had the uh, the pleasure of. Uh, having several conversations with you and uh, getting to work uh, alongside you in a couple of projects, which hopefully we'll discuss throughout the course of the next hour. So um, why don't we start just quickly, um, uh, just we'll go around um, how we're doing, how's the landscape with obviously the pandemic very quickly. And then Jennifer, if you want to just introduce some of your work. So uh, let's mix it up, Britain. Let's, how's things in uh, the US of A? Uh, you know, as crazy as ever. <laughs> um, you know, things, uh, things that are looking to open up, there's a lot of pressure from businesses, uh, you know, on our local governor, uh, to get things opened up. But uh, I think we've got a, a, a slower rollout, um, no sports, no sports in May, but, uh, youth sports are considered a, like a moderate risk. And so I think we're looking to get outside, you know, maybe June and just kind of start things slow. But, uh, you know, of course, we've got a big push, you know, to make sure that we've got summer tournaments going. And, uh, you know, we'll see how that goes. Well, you've got to have those summer tournaments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> apparently, we're only hurting the kids if we don't have them. That's uh, the latest argument. Uh, Mark, Sweden, the, uh, the, the yeah. country that's um, doing it differently. Well, we're not really. It's more... It's, it's more um, individual responsibility, th this whole strategy is. Um, but sports-wise, um, we are, um, yeah, kids are playing soccer. It's all started. It's, it's all, it all kicked off two weeks ago. Um, seems to be happening without hitches. In general, people are respecting social distancing. Adults are not really turning up for most of the games. I actually wondered by... One of the teams at AIK that I that I work with, and uh, from a distance across the road, actually just had a look, and there was about fifteen adults spread out way around the whole pitch. Right. So there's new recommendations that come out again, and the idea is we're trying to encourage parents just look, just leave your kids at the training at the game, and maybe go somewhere else, go right. home, or whatever, and just yeah. Try to just let kids play football and minimize adult contact, lots of social distancing. It's interesting yeah. because despite this, they say that we're not shut down here, but like cinema tickets are down by 90%. Uh, buses, uh, public transport is down by about 65, 70%, which when you consider with Ireland, it's down 80%. So it's not far off and Ireland is in total lockdown. Right. So, yeah, so we're playing, we're up, we're running, we'll, See how it goes. Mm. Can I add one one thing, uh, yeah. Mark, to your point? You bring up a few things. Uh, mm -hmm. The pollution in Salt Lake City is down to like an eighth of what it normally is. Wow. And bike sales are up 300%. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's not a bad thing. I mean, these are the, these are the opportunities that this will... Uh, forced us I think to do I mean it, I said it last week didn't I I mean maybe there's a, a natural reset here in many different areas but before we get into that um, Jennifer how's uh, the Kingston area? Uh, the Kingston area where uh, I think people are really bought into uh, the physical distancing and, and listening best we can uh, we've been quite fortunate here but there are um, you know, cases in, in the surrounding areas. So I think everyone's, you know, maintaining being vigilant. Um, I mean, the universities have been, uh, you know, everyone's who can is working from home and uh, looking at, you know, how to address this both now um, and for the fall and winter semester. So I think there's lots of conversations about what that will look like. Um, so uh, we'll have to wait to see what that happens. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't uh, I actually didn't study the uh, Ontario kind of phase. It wasn't too clear in the article I read, but 
is there a plan for the universities to kick back in? Um, I think it's still up in the air as far as I know where they're, I think everyone's preparing for um, if, if they needed to be online, but also hoping that we can see the students again in person. So I think everyone's erring on the side of caution of be prepared. Um, and then uh, I think we're still on the basis. So uh, schools, like even the elementary schools are right now, they're uh, canceled till the end of May, but we don't know what's happening moving forward past that right. point yet. Right. Yeah, all now schools are open, Jennifer, in Sweden. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, until up to 16 at high school, it's, um, they, there's, they work from home online, but all the schools are open still there. How is, how is the online uh, teaching going? Um, I mean, it, the, uh, I actually was teaching a course where the students actually went and were supposed to do practical sessions in elementary school. So that was a bit of a difficult one to transition right. online, but right. the, uh, the students handled everything very well. Um, and I, you know, I think that was, if you'd asked people if they could, if they could transition an entire university in six days online, um, they probably would have said they couldn't, but everyone really did band together to try to get, um, as much as they could online and, People were delivering online lectures and, um, you know, revamping assignments. So um, I think we've had, all had lots of lessons learned too. So hopefully we can learn from that and, and improve if we need to keep keep going that way. Well, I may uh, I may speak to you offline because I'm I'm actually delivering my first uh, workshop for the province, uh, making ethical decisions next week online. So um, there'll probably be twenty plus people involved. So that's going to be interesting. Um, yeah, just a quick one on Nova Scotia. Um, schools middle of May, uh, but I think it's just more so of a. Uh, they've said they're not ready to. I think roll out their their full plan because um, we were supposed to get an update uh, for early May, and they just said you know we'll uh, we'll give you a full update two weeks into May. And I think really what that is, it's they're going to um, pull the plug on the school year. If I was going to take a guess. And um, based on some of the uh, press conferences that I've been able to um, listen to, it seems that tourism and sport are going to be the last uh, industries to to get open. Um, it, it, that's that's what I'm taking from it. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert and I'm, I'm obviously definitely making some assumptions there, which would suggest that I think until there's a vaccine accessible to the mass, I just think sport's going to get pushed back in Nova Scotia. That's That's what I feel. So, yeah, which which obviously uh, an implication of many, many people are going to have some financial uh, uh, hard times, I think, over the next 12 months, which is very worrying. And I'm in that boat. So, yeah. Um, but let's try and uh, not dampen the mood. Let's uh, let's talk about some positive things. Um, so, Jennifer, uh, again, it's really great that you, you're with us. Um, I absolutely love the, the stuff and the work that you have uh, put out and been obviously working in collaboration with Canada Soccer. I think for the, the people listening, because we do have a bit of a global audience, um, I'll share uh, with uh, Britain and Mark offline some of that uh, analytics that I've managed to obtain. But there's a global audience around... Uh, you know, how sports are engaging youth, how we're engaging organizations. And I know that's a big component that you've been involved in with your work at Queen's. So do you want to just give us a little uh, synopsis there of what it is that you're doing and what you're up to? Sure. So um, I I was from the sports psychology lab at Queen's University. So I worked with uh, Dr. Jean Cote and Dr. Luke Martin. And our emphasis is really understanding how to create high quality sport experiences so uh, most of my research focused on youth. So my master's was looking at coaching and, uh, and youth sport for children with disabilities. And in my PhD, I was focusing on coach leadership. So better understanding how coaches' leadership skills and their interpersonal behaviors affect athletes' personal development. And then in my postdoc, we were really focused on how can we better train coaches to be better leaders. So how can we actually help improve their interpersonal skills um, and testing uh, different methods for how we could actually improve coach education um, and again, focusing on personal development. So um, other branches of work that we do look at things such as sampling and specialization in sport. So what effect that has on youth development, both in the short and then long term. Uh, Dr. Luke Martin does a lot of work on group dynamics, so understanding the team aspect of the sport environment and how coaches can influence teams. So we're doing quite a bit of work right now looking at subgroups and cliques in sports teams and their implications. 
Uh, we also have work looking at the broader environment. So things like organizational structures in terms of relative age effects, but also uh, how communities and culture affect sport. So um, we also have branches where we look at other interpersonal relationships. So where I've done a lot of coaching research, other people are looking at how parents play into this, but also uh, peers and teammates. So that's a little bit about uh, the work that the lab does. Um, and the, the key thing that I think we're, we're really focusing on right now is not only doing research, but how can we actually get research to the people who mm -hmm. need it? And how can we actually work together with sport organizations to A, ask better research questions, but also how can we use research to actually improve the sport uh, experience for people? So um, moving beyond publishing papers and more so how do we actually use the findings of that uh, in everyday practice? Excellent. I mean, there's a lot going on there then. Um, do you want to speak a little bit to how maybe that transition is going, particularly with uh, the, the relationship with Canada Soccer? Yeah, we had a, I mean, a, a really unique opportunity where uh, Jason DeRoss, actually from Canada Soccer, actually came to visit. Uh, well, Jean in particular, in terms of understanding, you know, potential links between the, what Canada Soccer was trying to do and how they were trying to improve their sport system and create you know, high quality experiences for their athletes. And through that conversation, uh, we had an opportunity to share some of the work that we were doing. And so particularly that linked well with um, work I was doing in my PhD and postdoc on uh, transformational coaching and those observing coaches, leadership behaviors and, and the turning that into a workshop. Um, so we had a really unique opportunity to both, you know, um, they were revamping some of their coach education programs. So work together in terms of seeing if there was a place uh, where it could fit. So um, really, we had a chance to try try our workshop right, with lots of different Canada soccer audiences, get feedback, um, and certainly improved uh, the quality of that. And we were able to get a better sense of, you know, how does that content actually align with people's real world experiences um, and get feedback uh, in terms of improving it. And then we found a home for it actually in the uh, new children's license. So mm -hmm. that became one of the, the one of the big things that we were working on was actually how do we embed it within the children's license and take this idea of, you know, training interpersonal um, skills and behaviors and how can we improve relationships between coaches and athletes. So that really became part of it where that's now integrated into the children's license. Um, and again, looking for more opportunities to see how can we keep building uh, from there. So, um, again, it was so nice for us just to have a chance to um really actually work with the partner in terms of what what do they need and where how does our research fit within your coach education structure so it wasn't a um a one size fits all approach but rather really making sure that it made sense for for soccer coaches excellent jennifer how common is it that um do you think it is that national governing bodies actually reach out to research well i think i think we've um, certainly, I think that's been a huge gap in, you know, we talk a lot about knowledge translation, and I think researchers are trying to make better efforts, but we can certainly improve ours. And I think, you know, the idea of a sport organization reaching out to, to us, um, I think just really helped kickstart where we were, we were really starting from a good place where we were actually addressing an issue that they had. Um, so I would encourage, I, uh, again, I think, I know on the researcher side, we're trying to make a much better effort. Um, to be visible and to actually go to places and, and be easier to find. But I encourage any sport organization who has questions or needs help or wants to look at the evidence, um, please feel free to reach out to you know, any universities in terms of, again, that could be a kinesiology lab or um, other you know, human kinetics or sports psychology, um, where we have students and we have resources that we would love to help. So um, I think that's that piece or you know, if you have an article that you can't get access to, Again, uh, please feel free to email those authors. Uh, we'd love to share our work. Um, and it is very meaning, our work's much more meaningful if it has an impact in the real world. With, with the children's license, um, it's now embedded into kind of the, um, the mentorship, um, you know, the observation as well with the coaches on their um, interactions with the players. Um, I mean, obviously, that's uh, part, of, part and parcel of the module that's also delivered with inside the children's license. Um, how is how is the transformational uh, coaching module going in, in the sense of with other sports? Have you had much uh, interaction with, you know, I know obviously we, we somewhat answered the, the first, 
my question earlier, but in terms of the actual package, you've built a package really where coaches can can access some of your findings and, and some of the, the theory associated to it. How is that going? And, and if it's not going well, is there a way that maybe people listening here can contact you and figure out how they can engage in that content? Absolutely. So um, I think we're uh, we're certainly seeing uh, opportunities to present to different audiences. So we've had different multi-sport um, opportunities at both sort of university, uh, but also international level. So uh, we were been help, been helping to go to to Rome uh, in March to look to talk with the Italian Olympic Committee, but that didn't happen with everything that was going on. Um, but seeing different ways that it it, it could, um, and we've we've been talking with uh, rowing. Um, and, you know, again, trying to see where there's a fit there um, and also just trying to get a better sense um, with sort of both national governing organizations in terms of where can it fit. Um, and I think that's that piece where, um, again, if people are interested in, you know, this idea of learning about interpersonal behaviors, um, one of the nice things I think you, you highlighted uh, was not only are there behaviors that are contained within the workshop, but we actually have a way of measuring them. So we can actually measure and see these behaviors uh, through observation and see change. So that's one of the things that we've been working on as well is when we talk about having a language for interpersonal behaviors, but also how can we give coaches feedback um, and see their change in these behaviors. So you're not just learning about them, but you're actually seeing how your behaviors change over time. So that's been a, yeah. a really interesting piece. But um, you know, certainly uh, anyone who's interested in in that piece uh, is more than welcome to both email myself or I said uh, Dr. Jean Cote at, at Queen's University as well. How long is the workshop, Jennifer? Now, I mean, when it started, it was it was it's been transforming itself through you know different <laughs> um, deliveries. How long how long is it now? So the the original one is around for about four hours for an in-person. Um, given everything that's going on, we're looking at um, opportunities for online uh, delivery and, and how to shift that and create opportunities where people can access it um, asynchronously or um, just not in person. Um, so that's a project that's ongoing right now. And then uh, we're also working. So one of the things that we've been trying to build is also a shorter version. So more of a one hour introduction. Um, so you just, you're getting awareness of, of transformational coaching and that, that that could then build onto the longer workshop. Um, and then one of the uh, other future goals that we've been working with the children's license is also an on-field component. So not only being in the classroom and learning about these behaviors, but actually having a chance to go out into the field and try them out and get feedback. So um, that's been put on hold a little bit if, with everything that's going on, but um, stay tuned for, for that version as well. It, it kind of ties into uh, the, 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 the uh, quote, Mark, with those who only know football don't know football because they really, at the end of the day, if you, it, you, better people make the better experience. And this is the part that we don't seem to ever really wrestle with when we go on coaching courses or coaching workshops. It's all, a lot of it's X's and O's. Um, I mean, Mark, you, you came into Halifax uh, and, and sat in and, and observed that. And I know we've, we've spoken to that uh, briefly. I mean, how does that, how, is there, is that shift slowly changing in, in Sweden with your experience? Because you were a coach educator. I don't know if you still are. Um, how is that over I mean, there? I haven't been doing any for a few months now because I've been focusing on my uh, PhD and on my work at the club. Um, yeah, it is going now with the discussion. Well, what's interesting about Sweden is that all these discussions that we've been having, particularly in the last four, well, in, let's if we look at the discussion with J Jason and the Dutch FA last week that we had, and with um, Bastian uh, from Willem and uh, Michael, the journalist, particularly those discussions, the, they have been played out in the national media for a few years now. There was even a, a documentary done about, called uh, sports heaven and hell about children in sport very odd fly on the wall things going around sweden and that really opened up a lot opened up the debate a lot and yeah for good or bad because it, it, it was it's been quite polarized for a while but i'm feeling that there's a lot of young coaches coming in that i've met that are let's just say they're educated in football of course, through the courses, but they're also more educated. They go to the academia world. Some of them are doing masters while doing their badges, coaching badges. And they're, they're starting to understand 
the bigger picture of child youth sport. They're speaking about it. They're searching for for, for um, better questions around it, as as Jennifer spoke and mentioned earlier. And that's really exciting. I think I'm I'm quite excited about a lot of the younger coaches I meet. They're really looking even at the social, cultural, and historic constraints on um, learning, development, sport, the generic linear models, etc. So it's happening. But also then. I think, and I don't know what you think, guys, I always find that when we have a time of, well, it's not so much change, evolution, the first national, uh, the first natural human instinct is to protect your job, as opposed yeah. to that, wow, this is a great opportunity to learn. So we're kind of in the middle of this phase where there's still a bit of inertia trying to hold, this, hold, hold things back, but there's a lot of bright young coaches coming up. Really, really, really bright. So I'm, I'm, I've got good hopes for the future with, with that. And they, they see beyond just the X's and the O's. They're, quite, they're skillful on the pitch, but few of them are, are really see beyond that. It's, it's funny. Um, I had this conversation with somebody that's involved in trying to build, um, really, I think, for this natural uh, pause in the sporting landscape uh, to ask the right questions of what sport should be. And um, it, it, we got into this whole notion of, you know, these if you categorize people, the maintainers are the people that are protecting their jobs and the builders are the ones that uh, are the ones that I guess are the maintainer kind of category of person is feeling threatened and usually discredits the person as you maybe you've, you've, mm. you've um, tried to describe there comes in with, you know, a, a wide variety of knowledge and experience through maybe, as you say, uh, being a part of some form of academia. How do we get those individuals? And Jennifer, maybe you can speak to it a little bit more as well. And Britain, I don't know how it is in the US, but how do we get those individuals, I guess, a little bit more clout in the sense of giving them an opportunity to build? Because there is this notion, as you say, I want to protect what's mine and you're making me uncomfortable and I don't want you around. Therefore, I'm going to discredit everything you say. Thoughts? Anyone? <laughs> I'm like overwhelmed with thoughts there. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, the, we don't have the same, and that Canada is probably similar, but we don't have the same infrastructure as, as far as the, you know, the federations and things go. And we don't really have the professional team supporting, you know, our structure. So in the absence of, you know, what we would call the pay to play model, um, I don't know what would exist, uh, you know, in its absence. Uh, we don't see a lot of, you know, we don't see a lot of pickup games. We used to, we used to drive around and, you know, basketball courts are everywhere and they would be full and they would have people in the stands, you know, waiting to get on the court and, you know, winter stays and that sort of thing. It, it, it all kind of disappeared. So it's this chicken or the egg problem. Um, you know, is it because of the, you know, the infrastructure and the professionalization that we've installed that, uh, you know, kids are no longer participating in, you know, just kind of these impromptu pickup games. Um, they're not self-organizing, you know, around sport because, you know, sports already been or sports already available to them. You know, they've got their set teams, they've done tryouts or, or whatever. So it's, uh, it's something that I, I don't, I don't know. And, it, you know, it would be great if the if it was financially supported by, you know, professional team. Um, but the money, the money seems to float upward. Uh, you know, part of a registration fee, you know, goes to our state. Uh, part of that registration fee goes to U.S. Youth Soccer. And then part of that goes to U.S. Soccer. And, uh, you know, they're kind of the, the authority with the ones with all of the solutions and the movements and the initiatives and everything. Um, but... Uh, we don't see any, you know, real direct investment. And U.S. Soccer has done done a little bit as far, well, a lot as far as coaching education and kind of subsidizing the cost of coaching education. You know, nevertheless, it's you know four thousand dollars for an A license. Um, you know, they invested in a lot of instructors to try to create these better experiences, like you guys are talking about. Um, I think that cost them seven or eight thousand dollars per instructor, and they. You know, they paid for the first thousand. So, uh, you know, the support of structure is a little bit different. Um, you know, we're up to parks and, you know, stepping on. You know, I think I pay close to $65,000 for indoor training. 
and around $30,000 for outdoor fields just to play in our league games. Um, so the, you know, the pay to play, the pay to play model. Um, and I know that's not like the focus of it, but, uh, yeah, as far as, as far as how we're developing and everything, it's, there's no, there's no financial support outside of dues being paid. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, that's quite unique to probably more so the North American market versus um, obviously Europe where, you know, obviously I've experienced growing up playing in that system as well. Um, I mean, is that, it's, I guess, is that common as well? What you see Jennifer for your experience with other sports in, in, in North America? Um, I, I, th I think the, the issue of play, I think is an issue that extends beyond sport as well, where, you know, right. how are we, how are we creating environments where, uh, children are, are encouraged to play and play for play sake rather than um, a specific outcome. So uh, I think that's a bigger question that we were, we're always wrestling with right now in terms of how do we, uh, again, create environments where children are allowed to, to really be children and enjoy playing. And so I think that's where um, certainly um, uh, we had done, there is research on the benefits of deliberate play and that's been out there for about 20, 30 years. And I think you're starting to see that actually start to sort of pique people's interest again um, with this idea of, you know, how do we actually get people playing? So one of the things that uh, we've been interested in is the idea of looking at the immediate sport experience. So we often focus on really long-term outcomes that these are all the things that we want sport to achieve you know, 20, 30 down, years down the road. But sometimes when we take that really long view, we lose sight of what's happening in the moment. So in the moment, we need to create those experiences where children are, you know, having fun or, or, you know, enjoying themselves or working hard and are using the sources of enjoyment that are meaningful to them. So I think it's one of those pieces where it's really coming back to what are we doing sport for and who are we and who are we doing it for? Um, so I think that's that piece where, again, putting it, you know, putting the child at the center of it and understanding what what's meaningful to them um, and how do we create that good experience? Because really, I think what we're trying to do is get people interested in sport. We want them to like doing it so that they come back, that they spend time, you know, not just playing soccer, but they might, you know, read articles about it or they might watch it on TV or they're talking to their friends about it. So it becomes really part of this broader who they are and, and that idea. So uh, I think that's that piece where sort of going back to that basics in terms of what when you go onto the field or when you're talking with your coach or when you're having a peer interaction, what's that immediate experience look like? How can we improve the quality of that moment to moment? Because it's all those moments together that actually lead to development. So I think sometimes we have this idea of, you know, this is what we want to achieve long term, but we forget all this, all those day to day that sport mm -hmm. development comes back to the day to day. So if you're having a good day to day experience, that's when you'll actually see those developments. So, um, and I think certainly on the on the research side, what we we need to better understand, and I think this is where um, you know even hearing the conversation today is really helpful in terms of we need to you know think about what questions we're asking, but also mm. you know what's happening, what do you need help with? So in terms of you know those idea of the people who are um, afraid of change, maybe it's engaging with them and actually talking to them to and and really analyzing what is it, what are those barriers to change that you're afraid of, because it might be different than what we're assuming. We may not be using the right messages to encourage them to change. So I think that's that piece too, where, um, it, you know, working together and, and understanding how do we, you know, I think there's a lot more common ground between people who are afraid to change where everyone's really well-intentioned. That's what I've found in sport is people at the end of the day are trying to do good things. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's more so helping them understand that we can achieve those same goals just through a different path that you might be used to. So I think that's trying to highlight the common ground that we have of this is what we're trying to achieve. This is how we can, how we can get there. Um, and I'll always lean on the side of, if we have data to back us up, I think that's a, a, a nice place where it's based more on, on, on data and evidence um, that can really help bolster why we're doing the things we do rather than the, uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time um, mentality. Jennifer, I think, isn't it interesting how that 
we probably need to reconceptualize child youth sport as something that is beyond organized sport. Now, uh, because it's when we just say youth, uh, youth football, we just everyone just immediately goes organized club competition. Yeah. And I think we need to start con- uh, reconceptualizing and move it beyond that. And that's going to be very difficult when you consider the limited opportunities for children to interact with their environment. If you look at, um, I was recently in the UK and I was shocked at the amount of no ball playing signs there are everywhere. Keep off the grass, no ball playing signs, you know, no game, no running, no jumping. And I think that if, if you're limiting these opportunities for children to interact, then you're just driving everything towards the organized sport when really we need to kind of open it up and reconceptualize it. Absolutely. And I think that's that piece where, you know, even some of the, the studies that we've done where uh, we were looking at, you know, interactions that happen between youth led versus adult led activities and you see different behaviors and you yeah. see different benefits from those experiences. So I think that's the idea. Um, we often talk about, you know, there's different like sport really as a continuum of activities where you have ones that are more child led versus more adult led, but you also have ones that are really targeted towards performance and others that are targeted towards pure enjoyment and that you need a mix. And I think that's been the biggest finding that we've found is it's all about diversity, that you want diverse experiences. So you want a mix of play and practice. You want a mix of different sports that you want diverse, you know, social interactions that that diversity is really what helps drive uh, development. So again, if we can understand how we can create those diverse experiences, um, I think that's a question that we're we're going to be asking right now in terms of the current situation where unorganized sport and what we're normally used to for some places is off the table. So what does that look like? So if you're only allowed your backyard, what does play look like? How can you encourage play? Um, you know, if you're having a chance to, you know, play with your siblings, there's actually some really interesting research on the benefits of playing with siblings at that mixed age play so how can we also capture you know what people are going through right now when they're having to interact with sport differently than they they might in a in a typical day but isn't academia also i I mean uh, you know i'm probably biting the hand that feeds here um also anytime you you go to academia looking for child youth sport in general now there are exceptions of course you end up it's all been the questions are all being asked around organized sport. So when we're looking for better questions, maybe we need we need those questions need to stretch beyond the organized sport in, in, in research and academia. I know you and Jean do a lot of work in this area, but in, I think in general. Yeah, absolutely absolutely. And I think uh, one of the one of the things that we are was always um, on our bucket list of projects was actually trying to look more at play. So when you see kids pl- just playing what does that look like and what, you know, what outcomes does that have? And I think that's a, a huge opportunity to better understand uh, play. Um, mm-hmm. And another round, I think, is that, you know, um, we'll, we'll talk in terms of this idea of spontaneous practice where you have kids mm-hmm. who are, you know, who are shooting, you know, just in their driveway and that can be shooting pucks or, you know, on their basketball hoop and, and they're practicing on their own. And what does that look like? Um, so I think it's understanding those different forms of, of activity and, and how we uh, both measure it. There has to be opportunities for yeah. these to happen. I mean, if you look at urban planning now, how often is, it, is, the, is a child's opportunities to interact with the urban environment considered in new planning, new buildings, new apartment blocks, new shopping malls? The, I had a colleague who was writing a paper about play and they used this sort of idea, this a threshold model that if given the opportunity, children will play. Yeah, so I agree. so uh-huh. really what we're trying to do is just, like you said, get that threshold where we create environments just to let play happen. Just create, if you create opportunities for play, like kids will play and they'll play with each other. And um, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter if, you know, what equipment's there or, um, mm. you know, what they'll figure out ways of, of engaging with each other and they enjoy being active. So um, I, and I also encourage lots of, if you're interested, um, Amanda Visick uh, has some really interesting mm-hmm. work looking at fun and children's perceptions of fun and what are the determinants of a fun experience from their point of view. And there's actually some soccer specific studies as well. Mm-hmm. I think this I w- is in this um, landscape right now with uh, COVID-19, 
this is what I keep asking questions. And I asked my colleague here in Nova Scotia, because again, we, we, the adults are sitting down having conversations, Jennifer, about what this new normal might look like for kids with all of the resource constraints that are clearly going to be put on the system when we get back. And I just said to him the other day, I was like, again, why are we making these decisions? Why are we leading these conversations? Again, us adults, why are we not engaging the kids? What I mean, like, not only what do they miss, but what do they not miss? about sport ask that question and then start to build the you know or at least start to uh, give them an opportunity to when they do return that you know and i i agree with everything that you're, you're saying i think if we go that route it will look a lot less structured and that unfortunately if you think about again the hand that feeds you in britain probably what you're saying we're probably not as integral in the experience as we think we are and therefore jobs probably aren't required Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that. So um, I actually know um, some different conversations that have been, been happening and actually uh, studying that. So, you know, again, this is sort of a, a unique um, moment in, in history of our experience. So um, there is actually a study going on right now that's um, trying to ask people if we're, if we're in this moment, what's, what are you doing during this time? But also what would you like sport to look like when you come back? Um, so if anyone has ideas on, on, you know, that piece that there are researchers who are certainly interested in looking at that topic, um, and projects are developing right now, um, as we speak in terms of, again, how do we actually engage, you know, all the stakeholders in terms of, again, if we're, if we're having a chance to take a step back, uh, what, what does sport, what do we want it to look like? And is this maybe an opportunity to, to think critically about what sport is and, and how we, and how we engage with sport. So and yeah. again, I think if if Jennifer, if you have the, the the certain types of questions that you the the people that you're associated with are looking for, I know that here in Nova Scotia, there's potentially those kind of questions are going to be sent out. So if, okay. if we can align the questions so you have more data, then we're happy to probably uh, assist in that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's funny. I think it all comes back down to this quote: when you you step back, it is we. Are we really att uh, paying attention to what matters, Mark? It was what Dennis said last uh, two weeks ago. You know, it, it, the system, the system that we've created, we need to get their input, and we need to put the core emotional needs of what matters that they that they want, and go from there, and go and start it from there, and and that 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 does really put a lot of strain on this pay, pay to play model, and and I still think there's going to be opportunities for for people to have you know obviously careers in there but i just think it's been saturated to the point that it's probably not been a good thing i, I see the you know everybody like returning from sport so you know you played sport when you were a kid and you know you love it and the best job in the world is to go out and you know, go run soccer with, you know, with kids, right? Like it doesn't get better than that. If you don't appreciate that, um, you know, you're, you're doing the wrong thing, but I, I think it's a really attractive, uh, I guess, career path, especially when you start to figure out, well, I might be able to support myself on that, in that. Mm. So, you know, we probably do inflate our own significance, you know, a little bit. Um, I can, I can definitely, definitely see that. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting where you start to ask the question of, well, where do I actually add value, right? right. And uh, you know some of that perceived value is that you're you're adding value and providing experiences uh, in an ocean of bad of, of bad experiences, and that just may be my perception. But uh, it, when you watch, you kind of watch how things are being done. Um, it's hard to not think that they couldn't be improved. And, you know, uh, the, the coaching education piece, I, I actually do think is pretty integral because we, you know, we get coaches that, you know, volunteer for, you know, to coach rec teams and they're really uncomfortable and they don't know, really know what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, it's, it's hard not to, you know, go in there with you know, all of the solutions. I think it, an interesting point you raised too in terms of that idea of um, the, the value added for, 
I think the nice thing that we're, you know, you know, 30 past years of research, what we, what we do know is coaches can have an incredibly important influence on the developmental mm. experiences. But I think often what comes down to it is um, that really coaching is, I think we often talk about coaching in terms of the activities that you do, rather than really so much of the value added of coaching is those is in those interactions. So mm -hmm. it's not that you, you're providing an activity for kids to do, but that you're part of the activity and that you're engaging with them during that activity. So every, you know, you know, the observation that you provide, the instruction that you give, that, um, you know, how are you at the beginning of the practice? It's those little behaviors, that's all your value added, that when people at, often reflect on, you know, their best coaches, those, every time it comes down to the ones who, you know, saw value in them and that they pay, you know, that they were important and what they did was important and they mattered to someone. And I think that's such an, an interesting piece in terms of what, what coaches can do. It's be, being another person in a child's life that, you know, really cares and values their development and, and helps mm -hmm. them be better than they were. So I think that's that piece in terms of coming to, back to the coach education where we need to educate coaches of, of the important role that they have beyond providing activities. Um, I think so much of coaching is, is in those relationships and that potential influence we can have. So if we, and again, I think at that point, make people, give people the tools to do that more effectively. So um, I think that's that piece in terms of how we may actually pe make people feel more comfortable uh, and embrace that other aspect of coaching. Being present of the environment, right, Jennifer, being present and recognizing the needs of the people that you're talking to. Um, when you came in um, and we were fortunate to have Jennifer come in and, and part of her study, and it was interesting having the reflection with the, the two uh, coaches that you, you were working with. And you're right, like they were because the focus was so not about soccer, they felt completely more connected and attuned to the environment, whereas before it was like they had the session plan and they're trying to obviously, you know, achieve objectives, but they were never actually quite there with them. Um, and it definitely, it definitely had a, an effect on them when they went through that um, uh, video and had the opportunity to sit down with you and just, you know, reflect. So I, I definitely think it's something that we can make more prevalent in all courses, whether it's children's license or a youth license or an A license. I think it's really important. Um, yeah, it was, uh, again, anyone listening, certainly start to, to, to reach out to Jennifer because it's it makes you really think and if we if we really look at this and we are in the people business yes it's just sport and soccer that brings us together it's the it's the, the that's the thing we love but it, we are in the people business and if we don't have that tool those tools that skill sets then you're not really going to be that much an effective coach at the end of the day I think, I have a, you know, if, if you think about it, if any other industry had, and we call it because that's what it's become, child youth sport, had the potential through <clears throat> responsible, we'll say, uh, organization, responsible coaching, responsible leadership, save a society millions or billions in the future. We would jump, if that was that we jump at it. Yes, when you think of like the future health money we can save on health by having a really good child youth um, sports experience is it's phenomenal. It's actually it's something that I know it's it's in one of the, it's it's in one of the Swedish it's a, one of the Swedish uh, sport uh, national governing body sports organization. It's one of their aims: people's health, future health one of the main aims so if you're having a much healthier population due to child youth sport you're saving millions in heart monitors in the future billions and i think this is really um something that maybe should be considered more um yeah i i uh again healthcare in the united states is privatized and mm -hmm. so there's there's uh, I, I don't think hospitals make a lot of money, but insurance companies do. And uh, generally, when you're offering solutions that, that save people money, um, you're kind of on the wrong side of the equation. Uh, the solutions that they're looking for are what save insurance companies money. Um, and it's uh, built in and tied into our empathy here. Uh, I think people overall value 
you know, value health. I think people really value sport here. Um, but uh, I have to think that all of these all of these things play a part, right? So the economic model, uh, you know, to support youth sport or you know fields of resources and such, uh, again as a substitute for play, um, an economic model that would that would be great is if you know private industry sponsored. Uh, more of these activities so there was less you know less money coming out of pocket that's you know more opportunity you know for but uh i i just keep seeing us in this kind of a cyclical trap yeah but uh you know i'm optimistic but i think we'll i think we'll find things uh i think this gives us a really good opportunity again to to kind of reimagine what it looks like and it I think there's a lot of introspection among, uh, you know, directors and uh, governing bodies. Of what value do we actually offer? Yeah. And it's also, I think, in this stage, we talk about talking to the kids, but it's also educating the stakeholders because they the things I think we're talking about, you know, giving them, a, a, you know, less structure and maybe a, the uh, opportunity to play in an environment will be perceived by the parent, particularly in the North American pay-to-play model, as not value. That's not value at all. In fact, that's that's somebody not doing their job. That's how that's perceived. Um, so we have an opportunity here as well to try and educate, I think, all stakeholders that, you know, around some of these these theories and, and the research that's out there on what an experience, a sport and experience at the youth level should look like. Because I know it is something that uh, coaches tell me all the time on courses they are it's so frightened to be hands off because that is not the perception of coaching um, and they and they eventually just fall into that trap they they're the sage on the stage they they they're basically in full control because that's what the parent in, in their mind wants and that's what value is in there. and I'm, and I'm seeing it now even with the pandemic I'm seeing more structure entering people's houses like it's it, it, it's like where parents are desperate to put their kids in front of a Zoom meeting so that they can be babysat for an hour, and that's value. Like it's me- it's mental. So we have to somehow in this moment, yes, ask the right questions to the kids, but also start to somehow engage the wider stakeholders so that mm-hmm. we can come out of this the other side and value what the experience is. Because ultimately, the parents, in particularly in the North American market, they are going to decide what value is. You know, they are. They're the ones paying the dollars. <laughs> Thoughts? Um, the well, I think you're. <laughs> that's the question um, for our our next area, big area of research was actually look, talking to parents. Right. Um, to because I think that was one of the challenges we certainly saw too is that um, if we're only focusing on coaches, it's really hard to change a system if you're only talking to mm. parts of the system. So recognizing that the the pivotal role that parents play, and um, you know, again, you know. How do, how do we bridge that piece and, and again, see parents as such a, a pivotal resource in, in the sport experience? So, you know, they are the ones who will make those initial enrollment decisions. What sports do you do and what does that look like? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's that piece in terms of, again, understanding, you know, how do we, you know, help parents understand that if, if your goal is, you know, you know, personal development and uh, health and, you know, long-term performance, that actually all these things that we're talking about, you know, um, actually help to achieve that. So I think, again, I think, I don't think we've engaged enough with parents in yes. terms of, again, bringing them, um, again, helping them understand how we're creating those experiences. I think we also struggle with, we don't have that many um, examples to draw upon of what a good youth sport looks like. If mm. I ask most people what a good you no, know, name me a good coach. Most people would probably give you an example from the professional level. And they have all these adult driven examples of what coaching is supposed to look like. We don't really provide parents or examples for people to understand what a good youth sport looks like. That, you know, really that these are context specific and, you know, coaching is tailored to the age and stage of development uh, of your players. So, you know, how do we actually improve sort of representation of and, and understanding of what coaching looks like at different levels right. and I think that's part of the limitations that we have was we we take the the examples that we see in our everyday life and then we just apply them uh, to our children um, mm. and it's it's very difficult I think as adults to remember 
a different way of learning. Well, this is how I would like to learn, or this is how I remember feeling, but to actually go back in time, I think that's always, you know, um, certainly I'm seeing that with my, with my own daughter where, you know, six year olds see the world very differently. Um, and I think that's sort of a reminder of, you know, trying to see it through, through their eyes rather than through that adult version. So um, mm-hmm. I think that's a, that nice piece. And like you said, for the coach who sits there and doesn't tell the players what to do, but ask them questions. That's mm-hmm. such an important piece. And I think that's, again, tying that behavior to, well, we, we actually want kids who can make decisions and think for themselves and take initiative. Mm-hmm. So again, find that link between the behaviors that they're seeing uh, and the outcomes that they're hoping to achieve through sport. So uh-huh. hopefully we'll get there. And, and Jennifer, you say that we don't have uh, a good role model. I, I seen this with my eyes. I mean, Mark, I, I don't know if you can recall when you came into Nova Scotia and you ran the session and we had, you know, quite a large uh, audience watching Mark, um, you know, interact with the kids. And I think you had the same experience similar in, in Ontario. And it's people that are uh, around there that are, you know, have got the a perception of being a very good coach. And they were having such a tough time watching Mark interact with the kids to the point that that's not coaching. That's not coaching. And it, it was so fascinating to see this tug of war between you know, some people around there going, this is great. Look how much autonomy they have. They look at, they're, they're involved. They're asking questions. They're curious to find out more, you know, and then there's the others going, this is not right. It, 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 you're right. There is no best or good practice example of, of what youth coaching can look like that's accessible to people because it is, it's always professionally influenced. Mark, I mean, you, you go across, you've been traveling now for a long time, um, you know, I guess, showing the, the ways, I guess, AIK's uh, development framework. Um, is that common when you go to other places? I mean, I know it was in Canada. Do you get that that feeling that people are just at real uncomfortable with watching you? Um, yes and no. It's, it's, I think people turn up to these events for answers. And that's, that's probably the problem. And getting back to what Jennifer said at the start, really... I think the whole point of researching research for me is not what is my question is I'm going to find better questions. Yeah. We need to find much better questions. Um, and, and it's the same with the coach who's working with the kids. He needs to, to have better questions for the kids. And it's the same when, when you're working with adults in sport, you have the parents, how through my regular interactions with parents, with me as a coach or me as a leader in a club, can I encourage parents to actually ask better questions? Parents should be asking questions, but sometimes the questions come from a place maybe of not so informed opinions. They just, you know, they, they are, they know more about their own child as well, but maybe not as informed opinion on child youth sport, what it is. There, there's a path dependency of what it is, what the coach should look like, what should happen, you know, that, mixing up performance with learning these are all common things so as long as people come to these events expecting answers then we're going to get these reactions i have been asked uh, in ontario a guy actually he came up to me and he said look i don't know but i were you coaching but i was watching what was happening and it was really evolving the whole practice what the girls were doing was some 10 year old girls what they were doing and he said I, I didn't know if you were coaching in what I think is coaching, but it was really what they were doing was impressive. And I said, well, that's really what it's about. It's not what I do. It's what they do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm here to try and help facilitate a learning environment. Not do, you, yeah? do, you, do you remember the, 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 the boy? And it's interesting because you talk about um, opportunities to inter- interact with the environment. The child who you asked the question and he he was like, I'm, he put his hand up. He said, I'm confused. And you're like, well, what are you confused about? And he's like, well, I'm confused because you're not saying too much. And then you asked him the question and he answered the question perfectly. And you went, you don't sound confused to me, but he was so, the environment was so different to what he was used to. And it was so interesting just to sit back and observe that it was so fascinating. Um, And I think the more we can create those environments where the kids are, 
at the forefront of their of their learning experience and they are leading the direction because as we said and we've talked about it several times on the other podcast we need to meet each individual where they are it's not about the coach where they are i I think this and jennifer probably has some good insights into this but we could we can take this idea of limiting errors which is really what a lot of coaching i can be about traditional coaching we we perform these predictable patterns during practice that we will regurgitate in the match and win games, passing patterns. That's to limit errors. Here is the correct way to do a technique because we there's to, you know we, we want to limit errors, but really we need to embrace this variability in a, in learning because what we we're, we're basing everything on outcomes of probably a top professional player. The outcome is just. It, it's just the performance of something, but there is so much variability going on inside, say, a human body, how the body self-organizes to pass a ball. It can do it in so many different ways. Yes, we are, and this is ideas of degener- degeneracy and self-regulation, yet we are teaching kids explicitly the right way to do it, mm-hmm. the correct. When really, as I said, the, the body can self-organize itself and its muscles, tendons, everything in so many different ways to perform the same task. And this is something that needs to be embraced, I, I, th- I think, more particularly in coach education and particularly by coaches because they want the answers. They want the exact right way to do everything. And in many ways, I have no answers. So oh, mm. just maybe in a few better questions. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, well, it's, I think it's... A... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, I was just going to tie it back to what you know what you mentioned earlier is that uh, you know sometimes because we're you know we're all about development and you know the kids have to be a certain place by a certain time we kind of uh, we don't see the immediate outcome and mm-hmm. when we go into that error correction like you're talking about Mark you know what what impact does that have on their immediate experience mm-hmm. and I, we're not thinking about their immediate experience you know if we're just pointing out the you know the right way to do things. Yeah. Go ahead. The uh, well, we've been talking a lot about understanding coaching, and um, we've also been looking at coaching not only in sport but also in medical education. So how do we train our future doctors? And it's been an interesting piece seeing similarities between contexts. And one of the things that's come up is this idea of um, so. Our, a lot of our work is based on this idea of positive youth development, which is very strength-based. So can we see the strengths that children have and, and keep building? And I think there's often been a tendency in coaching to inadvertently use a deficit reduction model. We're going we're to see things that you're doing wrong and we're going to fix them. Mm. And, that, and that very much we end up in this place of problem solving, that coaches are there to help solve problems and fix things. Mm. And I think that's part of the issue where coaching isn't really about fixing people. It's, it's about seeing what they're, you know, what they're good at, what their potential is. How can we keep building from that? And I think mm-hmm. that's, I think that's going to take some change in terms of how we talk about coaching and coaching behaviors um, mm-hmm. that, you know, that's really what we're trying to do. I, I, that idea again of the limiting errors. Well, it's not necessarily in many ways, coaching's not about limiting errors. It's actually providing opportunities for errors to occur. Exactly. So, that, so that you can learn from them and you know that errors whether that's in practice or in a game are all ways of learning and developing so I think mm. that's that piece in terms of again sort of how do we sort of change the narrative around coaching from that sort of you know deficit we need to fix these things they're doing it wrong versus mm. you know this is the way that they're really good at achieve, you know doing the skill or this is a you know their strength um, and I think that's that piece where it's sort of being a little bit more open to that creativity and there's, there isn't one white, right way to play. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's, I think that's an, an issue that we're seeing, um, you know, something we've seen it with small sided games and, you know, cross ice hockey that things don't look like the real game. And I think we're trying to change the idea of, well, you know, there really isn't a real game that, you know, these are all things that we're choosing and that we make decisions. So we can ch- also choose to change it. And that we can make it better to suit the people who are participating. Um, so I think that's a, a lot of the the challenge that we're having in terms of how do we. And to that point, I think that was interesting. You said about you know showing Mark is it like an ex- providing people with different examples of what coaching looks like. 
Mm. Uh, because I know there's so many good youth sport coaches. And Mark, you said earlier that there's a younger generation of amazing coaches out mm. there. So I think what we what we we need to do is help capture and highlight those coaches. Mm. Here's a huge breadth of amazing coaches out there. And you'll probably see examples of things that you do yourself in them, but also maybe learn some things that you can try out as well. So how can we help share those coaching stories and those um, examples, I think would be such a huge value to see. You know, you know, Jennifer, I, I, there is, and, and even in my work at AIK, I've come across some parent coaches that really get what we're doing. Yeah. Even though they don't maybe, from a research perspective, they don't have the vocabulary, but if we speak to them in a way that they can get it or maybe are develop a curiosity that they want to find out more about ideas of, say, nonlinear pedagogy, et cetera, they really, really get it. And like, I had a coach, I'm going to watch the game the other night that I, I mentioned earlier, and the coach, I'll, I'll give him a mention, his name's Jonas Blockert because he, he's, doing, he's a parent coach doing an exceptional job. His whole strategy for the game with his ten, with their nine and ten year olds, was how do we make each other better mm. on the pitch? That was the whole tactical strategy. How do we make each other better? And this, of course, gets into creating space for each other. You know, dropping off, creating support behind and front, communicating, so many things. But the, he's all he focused on was how do we make each other? How do we make each other better? How do we help each other to be better on the pitch? And I think that was some of the best coaching I've seen in in the youth football. Very simple, very basic, yeah. but really rewarding. The children owned it. All he was on about how do you make, and then he was telling them, yeah, you know, I saw the, the way you made that run there. You know, you took a defender away and suddenly he had a free goal. So things like this, so important. There are really good parent coaches out there too. Just give them the chance. Don't, I try to avoid telling them what to do, but maybe helping them to develop a curiosity about what you're, what we're trying to achieve at your club, which with Canadian soccer, even you can say, I think we can go very far. And I, I think because we've had far too many of these prescriptive uh, stage-based models that every club has at six to eight, seven, we do these things. You must be able to do this with your left leg and this with your right leg at nine, do this. This is really problematic. This draws the focus away the, and the coach's focus away from the real purpose of, of what we're doing, which is creating opportunities for children to learn. And that, and as Jennifer said, that means also <laughs> errors. And and not exclusive to players, as you've said, to oh. coaches too. It's about learning how to learn, actually. That's what it looks yeah. Learn how to learn to play football. Learn how to learn to move. Well, I think that, that idea of how do we make each other better, I think that's, that pretty much sums up what sport can be. It's how do we make each other better on the field? How do we make each other better off? How do we, you know, in a coach education, how do we, you know, when you're working with other coaches, how do we make each other better? Um, how do we work together to make this better? With the same with coaches, how do we make each other better? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a really nice way of, um, I think that's the, always the, the potential of sport is to do really, mm -hmm. is to do really good things, but we have to come, we have to be intentional in terms of focusing on that. And, and Jennifer, this is even captured in the, um, the, the top, in the top, in top sports in the world, um, who the, 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 the tennis players, who the, the uh, the, Swiss, the Spanish and the Swiss players, what are their names? And, oh, oh Federer and Nadal. Yeah. Federer and Nadal. There's a great piece where, where uh, Federer speaks about that, you know, if Nadal wasn't around, I'd have won way more tournaments, and way more trophies and everything, but I would never have reached the level I'd have got to. Yeah. You know, I'm not at my best until you're at your best, and that's even your opponent. Yeah, no, there's a there's a great paper from Shields and Bredmeier that looks at competition and that idea of true competition, which all comes down to the competitions about opponents working together to make each other better and that you're actually pushing each other. That's what competition is all about, is actually helping make each other better. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I, again, I think that's such a nice way of, I, I think, again, to how do we change the narrative of sport? I think it's moving towards that idea of that, you know, even when we have you know, competitive structures, how are we designing yeah. them in a way to help make people better? Competition right. isn't you versus me, it's you and me. Yeah. 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 And that that is, uh, we've got a long way to go, I think, <laughs> before we get there. <laughs> Wonderful. Anything uh, anyone else wants to uh, bring up before we uh, we shut the ramble down? I, w I will say this. Um, when you were talking about the unorthodox uh, movements, Mark, um, have you ever watched Steve Smith, the cricket player? Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I was watching. There's a, there's a new documentary on uh, Amazon Prime called The Test, and he's super unorthodox but he's he's right now known as basically the best batsman in the world but he is literally like shadow batting around all the time that's all he does mm. he's literally but he's so awkward in his movements but it'd be interesting to get his story at some point and find out you know what his experience was as a youth player because he's just doing it all the time all maybe the time. Ian Redshaw might know about that I might ask him yeah yeah anyway it's he's, worth watching if anyone's uh, missing sport it's a great little uh, Irish, any sport where where you hit a ball with a stick with nobody marking you doesn't mean any <laughs> <laughs> actually just one thing i'd like to get back to just before we leave i think uh it's great um uh something that we might have missed uh that jennifer said at the beginning about how how these transformational workshops basically it's practicing the research in real environments to in further inform the research. And it's really important that it's not about research informing practice, it's also about practice informing research. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I think that that whole idea is that, you know, uh, I recognize the, the huge amount of knowledge that, uh, you know, parents, coaches, sport administrators, kids have, and how that can actually help inform us. And it's really about collaboration between um research and practice that it, it there's no one way direction that this is supposed to go but rather mm -hmm. that it's actually working working together and i think um again I'll, I'll you know commend jason where really he helped he really spearheaded that in terms of creating an environment where we we really were had a, a chance to work together and i think we were able to do lots of unique things um that really helped um, move that forward so i think you know that idea of you know this really is about partnerships and you know how can we partner together again to make each other better um i think that's again part of that so yeah thank you thank you mark for for raising that wonderful great it could be the title of the episode how do we make each other better exactly there you go it's hard. all right folks well thanks again jennifer for sh uh, sharing your time um Britain, pleasure as always mark pleasure as always thanks guys right. thank you Stop the recording, we'll just uh, have a quick chat. <laughs>